Yeah. Bring in a bunch. Check test one, two, check test one, two, test one, two, three, four. Transmission test, check one, two, check one, two, three, four. Check test one, two, audio check for transmission. That's the worst part of having the Friday Sunday game. You don't get to
University of Dayton is on its way to the interview area. Just a reminder, no flash photography is allowed. Please silence your cell phones and no recording is allowed. If you need the access to the FTP site or the satellite coordinates, check with Hammond's Communications in the back of the room. Okay, we've been joined by Dayton. Well, our format will be an opening statement from Coach, and then we'll take questions for the players. Once we are done with questions for the players, they'll be dismissed, and the locker room will be open. We'll stay with, uh, with Archie. So, Coach? Uh, well, first, it's, um, it's great to be back. Um, you know, for these guys, their fourth year in a row, and uh, to be in Indy and uh, to play in this facility with the, uh, the other teams that are participating here, it's really, really exciting, and um, we're, uh, we're really excited to, to get started. Wichita State is a fantastic team, um, and uh, we have our work cut out for us, but at this time of year, I think everybody pretty much anticipates everything being hard-earned, so uh, we prepared hard, and we're excited to be here. Okay, questions for the players, and raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. It's going to be a very, here we go. <laughs> I'll start with Scooch. Uh, do you feel like you guys, after a long grind all season, an A-10 tournament, and now coming here, is this a chance to hit the reset button? Question for Scoochie. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, this is a, one of our goals that we want to accomplish coming into the season and just make it this far as a blessing. And, you know, we want to put it all out there on the court starting tomorrow night. Raise your hands, please. Right here. Uh, Gary Tipton, Lexington Herald Leader. For any of the players, the past experience you've had in the playing in the NCAA tournament, how do you think that can help? Kendall, we'll start with you. Uh, uh, experience in an NCAA tournament uh, is terrific to have. Um, all, all of us has played in the tournament. And uh, we'll try to go out there and share some of our leadership with our teammates. Scoochie? Um, just being a strong-minded group of guys and being together, I think it'll go a long way. And uh, all of us here have won games in the NCAA tournament, and we know what it takes to win. So just having that, I think we'll be fine. Charles? Just what school said, just uh, knowing what it takes to win at this time of the year. It's tough to win games, so just got to go out there and play hard and uh, do what we do best and do what we've been doing all year. Kyle? Um, I think uh, just being able to lead the team, we have experience from uh, the upperclassmen just teaching the <coughs> lowerclassmen how to step up and be ready to play in, you know, big time moments. Questions, please? Right here. Uh, for Scoochie and Kendall, 
how does some of the wars you have with Rhode Island and VCU and some of the other top teams in your league prepare you, think, for the kind of battle you might have at Wichita State? Kendall, we'll start with you. Uh, <clears throat> well, those two teams you mentioned, uh, they're very physical. They rebound the ball, and uh, Wichita State is the same way. So we'll go in there and uh, be tough-minded and rebound the ball, roll it up with them. Scooty? Um, just watching film in Wichita State, you know, you put it, uh, two teams like Rhode Island and VCU and mix them together, a team like Wichita State, and, you know, just being battle-tested throughout the conference of the A-10, playing against teams of that nature, I think it prepares us well for tomorrow night. Okay. Right here. Uh, for, for all the guys, and, and you too, Arch, um, <coughs> what was your first memory as, as a kid of watching an NCAA tournament game and saying, well, I want to do that someday? Kyle, we'll start with you. Uh, to be honest, I don't have no memory. You know, it's, I really, really wasn't thinking about it. Uh, but when we first stepped on the campus, me, Scooch, and Kendall, our dream was to get to the NCAA tournament. And we did our freshman year, and look at us now four years, I mean, three years later. Charles? I know for me, definitely. Uh, always watching basketball, seeing some of the uh, best college players. Uh, come in and win games and do big things. So uh, it's, def it's definitely a special moment and, and it's a, bl a blessing to get here. So uh, <coughs> we're just trying to capitalize and uh, do the best we can out here. Scooch? Um, just going through all these years, watching basketball all my life, you know, it's been a dream of mine just to play on this stage and just to get here, I don't want to take it for granted. And, you know, um, it's not one specific memory that I have, but these memories that I do have the past few years been real good ones. Kendall? Uh, for me, I think I was watching a tournament game. Uh, Marquette I used to follow Dwayne Wade when I was younger. So uh, I think they went to the Final Four that year. And uh, that's the only memory. That was my first memory of the NCAA tournament. Coach? There's a lot of memories. Uh, I've been watching it a lot longer than these guys have. But I think uh, Duke, Kentucky with uh, Leitner's uh, last shot, I can remember the whole game, you know, sitting there watching it at home. And, uh, you know, that, that that type of environment, that type of feeling, um, you want to be a part of that. Questions for the players right here? Paul Solentrop with Wichita Eagle. Kyle and, and Scucci, if you could, uh, Wichita State's three-point <coughs> shooting, what kind of challenges does that present? Is there maybe a team that you played throughout the year that is kind of similar in, in, in that aspect? Kyle? Uh, you know, we, we did a lot of scouting in uh, Three-pointing is a challenge for us this game, but uh, we didn't work hard on it all year and defended a lot of teams that had good uh, three-point percentages, and we know what we have to do to get the job done. Good. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a team I can think of that reminds me of Wichita State in terms of three-point shooting, but um, I know if we do what we have to do, we'll be right there in the 10th floor to win the game. Questions, please? Right here. There's been a lot of talk about uh, Wichita State seeding. Has that added a little bit of a chip to your guys' shoulder at all? Kendall? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, the seeding, it is what it is. And <coughs> uh, they're, they're a good team. Uh, we're a good team. So we're just going to go out there and play. It don't matter about the seed. Questions, please? Is that it? All right, one more? OK. Yep. Uh, Dayton fans travel well. Um, how aware are you guys of a crowd at an either a away game or a, a neutral site when their Dayton fans are there? Charles? <laughs> um, definitely, you know, um, when Dayton fans uh, come to the game, uh, you see nothing but red when you look around the stands. And um, Dayton fans really travel well. They give us a big boost at home. They give us a big boost on the road. Um, neutral site. So, uh, it's a great thing to have Dayton fans at the game, um, whether you up or you down. Uh, you know, it feel like a home game, and uh, they definitely give you a boost. So I'm looking forward to see all the Dayton fans at the game for sure. Kyle, you want to try that? Um, Flyer Faithful has always been there and been supporting us since day one, and uh, always especially been there in the NCAA tournament. So I expect them to be out here full-fledged Dayton colors rooting us on. Anything else for the? Thanks, fellas. We'll continue for uh, Coach, right here. <coughs> uh, 
Archie, one of the challenges of being an accomplished coach is that your name gets attached to you know some of the openings that are out there. I mean, Illinois is open, Indiana open today. How, how do you handle that, uh, just the buzz and being attached to some of those things? I'm not attached to any of it. I think everybody else attaches me to them. And I think it speaks volumes about how we do things at Dayton. And that's the only thing I concern myself with. Um, growing up as a player, you're taught to eliminate noise and distractions and bring your best to the floor every day and sort of treat that with our players the same way. And it just wouldn't be right as a coach if you were thinking about anything other than them. And that's all I really concern myself with. Over here. Bob Lutz, Wichita Eagle. What uh, challenges does Shaquille Morris present to your team? A lot, a lot. You know, he's a terrific player. When you look at his uh, points and rebounds per minute played, I'm not sure there's a guy that's been more effective in his time on the court. And they're so deep that if he played on another team, he'd probably be getting close to 20 a game. Because they're so deep and they're so spread out with their minutes, um, you know, he doesn't have the numbers, the gaudy numbers, but he would. Uh, he does a great job of obviously establishing himself with positioning. He's a, a great offensive rebounder, and he's in a system and a style with terrific, uh, a terrific scheme around him where you just can't really load up and then try to put all your eggs in one basket. So um, he's going to present big challenges, as the rest of their players are. Uh, there's a reason they've won 30 games. Uh, he's a big reason why, and I think he'll be a big focal point of the game when he's in because uh, – you know, he's so efficient, so effective. And with our, you know, size, the way we've done things, you know, he, they, have the, they have the gift of a little bit in terms of being able to really work around him. So we're going to have to be, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have to be very tough-minded. We're going to have to be as disciplined as we can. And we're going to have to, you know, work very hard early um, in possessions to try and make sure that he doesn't get anything as easy as he, as he would. But it's a difficult challenge. It's a difficult challenge for any team. Next, please. Right here. Tim Slack, KGSO Wichita. Coach, when you saw the draw, how much of the concern about Wichita State was their depth? Um, you know, their depth is as good as any team in the country, and it's evolved through the course of the season. I think they've done a really great job of changing things from November to December and then into January, and now I think they've figured it out. Uh, what r rotations and lineups work best. But they have a lot of different guys that beat you. There's not one guy in the game that can't have a major impact in the game, whether it's scoring or rebounding or obviously defending the way that they do. So um, I think the overall depth, their ability to stay out of foul trouble, they don't really get bothered by those things. So it's a unique team to play against. You know, Typically, we're a team that gets fouled a lot. And uh, you know, being able to get teams in foul trouble is something that's important. They can sort of withstand a lot of that stuff, and they keep coming with very, very good players and bodies. So their depth is probably something that we haven't seen that type of team in the past, just the, the ability to you know, keep coming bodies at you. And I think that's probably a little bit why they're so successful is they really don't take the foot off the pedal. There's so many guys coming in and out at the same level. Um, and that overall over 40 minutes is one of the reasons, I think, that they are so dominant you know, in terms of being able to really extend leads late in games or take an eight-point game and then bang, it's 20, is just because of the overall firepower that just keeps coming. So it's probably the most impressive trait of their team is how they've been able to navigate that amount of bodies uh, to be that effective over the course of the year. Uh, right here. Paul Solentrop with the Wichita Eagle. Archie, have you talked to Sean about last year's Wichita State game in the NCAA tournament? Did he give you any advice? Or? He doesn't have any advice, none. <laughs> he didn't have any advice after that game. Um, I watched the game, uh, I think for a part of it anyway, and I haven't seen a team do that to one of Sean's teams maybe ever. I think that was the most impressive thing about it. But I've been following Wichita State as a head coach since I got the job. You know, I think in my second year when we were really getting ready to get started and trying to get our feet on the ground, I believe that was their run to the Final Four. And I watched them go through, I believe, Gonzaga at the time, who was a one seed, uh, beat Ohio State, if I'm not mistaken, in that Elite Eight to go to the Final Four. And they kind of motivated you. I mean, they motivated you to, to say to yourself, like, wow, you know, if those guys can be that tough, if they can play that hard, if they can have that type of culture, and something that you have to really rely on and say, if we could create something like that, you know, maybe maybe we could get there. And I think, you know, I just told Coach Marshall when I saw him a couple minutes ago, 
I mean, kind of look at Wichita State as a, as a program that gives a lot of places like ours the faith that they can play with anyone and they can beat anyone. And um, I think their game last year was great evidence against Arizona that they don't really care who they're playing. And uh, we tried to be the same way. And, um, you know, I think being here for our fourth year, there's a reason why. Right here. Archie, you and Greg uh, share a similar dilemma in that, you know, Power Five schools aren't exactly excited to face you in uh, a non-conference season. W what's the solution to that, uh, to make it easier for schools like yours, Wichita State, to get some of those opportunities in a non-conference season? Uh, that's not easy. Um, one, I would say that, you know, our home venue and their home venue, very similar places that there's no advantage in many ways for those schools to come and play us in home and homes, okay? I think, you know, secondly, I'm sure Coach Marshall and myself would also, we've started a lot of series on the road to go get those type of games. And uh, whether you're in an exempt event like they were in the Bahamas or we were in uh, Anaheim this year or Orlando together a, a year ago, you're trying to find ways to put yourselves, whether it be neutral situations where you can get them on one-shot deals or tournaments or send yourself on the road a few times and maybe get one back in return. Uh, but it's difficult. It's difficult. And I think it's getting more difficult. And as the years go by here within one year, two years, or three years, it could become almost impossible because, you know, as power conference teams continue to do their leagues and look at their leagues, um, they're going to play 20 games in a conference season. And then the next thing you know, all power fives will be playing 20 games in a conference season. And if you're an in the ACC and you're playing 20 regular season conference games and you're in an exempt event, you got a Big Ten challenge game, where's that game coming from? You know, I think so. It's a unique challenge. And, you know, I'm at a great place with a great administration and we're on the front end of things trying to be creative as we can. And I think, you know, being able to be, um, you know, in situations where we play, you know, neutral site games or going on the road a couple times, maybe too many, it doesn't matter. You just have to be able to put yourself in those situations. But, I mean, I think our leagues also are key to, to the future. And I think the Atlantic 10 has done a, a really nice job of being a multiple team league bid over the time that we've been there, whether it's been six, five, four, or three. So I don't think that will change as well. We still have opportunities within our league with good, good quality opponents as well. But scheduling, it's always hard. I think it continues to get even harder and harder, though. If you would, would you describe just how basketball was ingrained in you growing up in a basketball family? Yeah, I mean, I, I know nothing else. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Sean's 10 years older than me, so it wasn't like we have, like, this sibling rivalry type of thing. And being that he is 10 years older than me, you know, I was the tag-along for a long time. And being a tag-along at the age of 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, 11 years old, and you're able to watch uh, halftime performances or – all-American camps, uh, you know, through him growing up. And then obviously when he went to college, you know, at that point in time, I was starting to get into middle school and junior high. And that's when basketball became bigger than life, you know, watching him play at Pitt. And then my dad being my high school coach all the way through and having an opportunity to play college basketball. Um, you know, since, since I can remember, basketball has never been a part of the daily routine. And um, I guess that's some guys are born into houses of doctors, lawyers, whatever it may be. Our conversations were very simple. You know, it was about getting better. It was about competing. It was about learning how to, to be a great player. And all those conversations have probably turned us into coaches without us really realizing it. But um, it was a unique house to be a part of. And I think if you kind of look right now in 2017, look at some of the successes that we've had in post-playing career, you can really attribute a lot of that to growing up in the house that I was in. Over here. Scott Pask with the Wichita Eagle. Coach, with, with guys like Scucci and Kyle and Kendall that have so much game experience uh, under their belt, what does that do for you as a coach just to, to have that luxury of, of guys that have that much experience? Well, you don't panic as much in tough situations. Um, you know, I think with, with comes those guys' experience, I think a lot of times what people attribute it to is the, is the big wins and all that. But I, I don't think that I look at it um, as all the glory moments. You know, I've watched these guys grow up. I've watched them fight. Uh, most of our best moments, they haven't been the prettiest of games, you know. And you're down with 30-some seconds to go and 
or you're, you, you, know, you, you hit a buzzer shot at eight seconds. I just remember all the plays that they were involved in throughout the course of the battle. You know, you watch a guy like Scooch and watch his maturation, how good he is at the end of games for us. You watch guys like Kyle and Kendall being a part of like an amazing run being down with, with four to go. Those are the things I remember about those guys the most. And I think it gives you, co as a coach, confidence that as you walk into that environment tomorrow, you hope it's not too big. But at the same time, you know throughout the course of their career, if you just let it let them happen and keep, keep going with them, they'll find ways to keep you right there. And uh, we talked a lot about it last night. You know, there's a lot of people that they go back on those guys' careers or, or tenure together and they think about some of the, you know, the tournament runs and all that stuff. But if you really start to show some of the clips of the games that they've been involved with, they have been really hard fought, ugly, find a way type of moments that they've had to come through. It hasn't been like all this, uh, you know, Hollywood stuff. And I think, you know, as, as you look at them, you appreciate the fact that how much they've been through. You appreciate how much they've given of themselves in terms of their effort. But they really are about winning, too. And I think that's been the, the thing that I'll remember the most about them. But you feel confident, not that you ever feel good, but you feel confident at some point in time they're going to make something happen for you. Right back here. Coach Jim Lazarski with the Cincinnati Inquirer. I'm just curious, when the entire bracket came out, the draw came out for you, were you able to take a quick look at all of what John Brannon was able to do at Northern Kentucky? And, and I, I'm sure you know him a little bit from scouting Alabama years ago when he was on that staff. But just any thoughts on him or, or maybe what you've seen out of a first-year eligible program to get to this point? Well, um, number one, John uh, did a fantastic job this past season. Uh, where he started at and where they're at right now is a credit to him and his staff and what they've been able to establish. Got to know John a little bit through our Alabama competing days when he was there and then when he was named the head coach at Northern Kentucky, being right down the road, have stayed in communication with him pretty well. When he won the conference tournament, I text him uh, right after the game, just, you know, congratulations, man. What, a, what an awesome, awesome opportunity. And, um, but he's done a terrific job, and, and um, it's not easy to go to a place like Northern Kentucky right off the bat, especially in the Ryzen, which is a very tough league. Um, and they've taken advantage, you know, sort of their draw. And you could tell even last year when, they're, when they were playing that he had an identity about him. They had a system. They knew what they were doing. And I think this year just carried right over. But he, he, did, he did about as good of a job with a team this season as any coach in college basketball. And the fact that they're in the tournament right now, I mean, I think that speaks volumes. Right here. Hey, Coach, Jim Ayala with Indianapolis Star. Uh, I just read recently that you, uh, before every game, you like to put a number number five up in the top corner of the whiteboard there. And I was wondering if you could tell me why you do that and what that means to you. Well, um, if you're in our locker room um, and you're a part of our program, you sort of look, can look each other in the eye and probably saw all of us at our worst moment, whether that would be looking at me as a player or looking at a player as a coach, or looking at a coach to a coach. Um, probably the worst moments that any of us have experienced together, we kind of saw the worst of one another. And I think that uh, being here today, win or lose the game, for that room to be sitting here today after May 12th, you know, in many cases, a lot of places wouldn't pick themselves back up. Uh, but I put that number up on the board for one reason. Steve was a, he was an interesting guy. And he had a big impact on a lot of people. And he's sort of in the locker room. He was the locker room. And in many ways, when you're going through scouting reports and you're preparing for games, you want to win, you want to lose, every once in a while, if you just kind of just think back, take a deep step and say, wow, you know, where were we? Imagine if, imagine if that wouldn't have happened. Or nothing's really guaranteed if I leave this locker room right now. I don't know who's going to do what or what's going to happen. So you put it up there as a perspective of everybody kind of look up there, see it, and let's go out and have a good time. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that, you know, I can write that number up there for a long time. But in particular, this group uh, has been affected by it the most. And, uh, you know, you don't ever want to, to think about, you know, you move on from something like that. But you do. But at the same time, I think you have to take a deep breath every once in a while and just say, hey, man, everything's OK right now. You know, things are good, regardless of how you feel, regardless of if the game didn't go real well or it did go well. You know, you just got to think it day to day, and you got to do things together. And uh, that's the thing I'm probably most proud about this group is that uh, it was a hard road to get up off the ground. 
and uh, a lot harder than I ever anticipated for not just our players, but our staff personally. And uh, to be able to be here now, that's a good thing for a lot of people. It, it helped us. And, uh, you know, but Steve, Steve is a big impression on a lot of these guys. They won't forget him for the rest of their lives. Anything else for Coach? Thank you, Archie. See Thank you. Tomorrow. Thank you.
For those of you in the media work area, the University of Kentucky will be here in about five minutes.
For those of you in the media workroom, uh, University of Kentucky is on its way. Okay, we're joined by the University of Kentucky, and we'll stay with the format. We'll have a statement from Coach Calipari, and then we'll go to the student athletes. And when we have no more questions for the student athletes, we'll stay with Coach Cal. So, John. Um, this is a, uh, a team that I'm really proud to be coaching. Uh, young team, but you're also seeing three seniors up here who carried their weight, took over this team when they needed to, were able to step back and uh, when they needed to. Um, servant leaders, all three of them, have had a big impact on the year, and it's just fun to see young guys come together with veterans and figure it out together, and this team is uh, slowly becoming that team. Okay, questions for the student athletes? Raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. Anyone right here? Uh, Jim Lazarski with the Cincinnati Inquirer. Um, and maybe Michael or Dominique might be able to speak to this, but uh, Coach Brandon, coming from Alabama, I know he's kind of in charge of some perimeter uh, play out there. Just kind of curious as you look at NKU and, and their guard play, perimeter play, do you see some things from your history and, and looking back, um, a, a style of play, I guess, if you will, or, or, or how do you kind of see their guard play it coming from their coach on down. Michael? Uh, you know, we haven't watched a whole lot of film. Um, talented team from, uh, from what we have seen throughout the year. Um, team that we respect, they're, they're in our state, and um, it's great to be able to play them in our first game of the tournament. But uh, they look like a talented team, and we're excited for tomorrow. Dominique? Uh, yeah, like Mike said, we didn't watch a lot of film on them, but uh, we're definitely going to respect their guards. They got great guards, athletic, can get to the rim, and. Uh, we're just really excited to be able to play 
in-state team, and hopefully it'll be a great game. Let me, can I just say something? So you, we spend a lot of time on ourselves right now, and the stuff that they've watched has been personnel tape. We do all that stuff, and I, they'll watch 15, 20 minutes of tape on everybody we play. So that, please don't take it as disrespect. That's not, it's just how we do this. Right here. For Michael and uh, Coach, too. Michael, I think there's 26 Canadian guys in the tournament. Um, you know, just what does that say about the level of Canadian basketball? And I think the last Canadian guy to win a title was Kyle Wiltshire with Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. And also, Coach, if you could just kind of add what you've seen coming out of Canada. Michael? Uh, you know, it's a special <laughs> thing uh, for me personally. I take a lot of pride in that. Uh, Canadian basketball, it seems to be on the uprise. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a uh, teammate and close friend with Jamal the last year and uh, to be able to share that experience with him coming from uh, the same area, you know, um, it's really special to us. We take a lot of pride in it, a lot of pride in our country and uh, to see Canadian basketball kind of growing and a lot more Canadians coming uh, through the NCAA and into the NBA and stuff like that, it's, it's really great to see. John on Canadian basketball. Well, first, when, when he had senior night, we sang the Canadian National Anthem, which was really neat, by the way, really neat. Uh, but I love Toronto, so if there are any players in Toronto, I will go up there myself to recruit them, because I think that's one of the great cities in the world. Right here, for the players. Derek, I'm Jerry Eves, WKJK. Your improved defense the last 10 games has been remarkable. Why more concentration? Where did it come from? Derek? Um, I think it's just uh, it's coming down to the postseason. I want to crack down on a lot of things, you know, try and limit, you know, the defensive lapses that I would have, you know, in like the earlier part of the season, even towards the middle. So kind of have a little bit more sense of urgency this, t uh, urgency this time of the year. And it's kind of our last go around. So, like I said, just want to limit all those uh, lapses and, you know, make the most out of the games and, you know, carry on with the experience that we have, you know, take it from the And now the tell me the games. truth, you got engaged. And your fiance said, you better start guarding people. And all of a sudden, he's gotten better. Uh, I, you know, you know, I, I'm trying to do stuff. I don't know. Ever since I got engaged, I've been playing a lot better. And uh, we've been winning. So uh, you know, hopefully, it keeps going. Right here. Okay. Uh, Dominique, what has this ride been like for you from high school to now, having a chance to you know, help Kentucky pursue another national championship and just you know, all the opportunities you've had with this team? Question for Dominique. Uh, it's been unbelievable. Um, th this season has probably been, it's definitely been my best season. And uh, with a group of guys that actually wants me to be successful. And that's what motivates me because my teammates want me to do good. I, I want to do good for them. And I also know I got the whole state of Kentucky behind me, a Kentucky kid, and everybody's rooting for me to do good. Right here. Uh, Steve Jones from the Curry Journal. Uh, Dominic, uh, what are your memories playing against uh, LeVon Holland uh, from uh, in the state championship game? Uh, and uh, I think you were AAU teammates with him as well. Just yeah. thoughts on him and, and your memories of that of that awesome game that you guys had. Question for Dominic. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, a lot about that game. Uh, I know LeVon, uh, like you said, he was on my AAU team. He's a great player. Uh, I don't remember much about state, though, but I just remember the last shot is what I remember right now, and that's winning. Questions for the fellas? Anything else <coughs> right here? Mm -hmm. Derek, what do you uh, tell the young guys, you know, as they prepare to, you know, get into the NCAA tournament, all of the hoopla, media, and everything that comes with that, to stay focused? How do you, what do you tell them? For Derek? Um, a lot of it's just kind of leading by example. A lot of, um, you know, the games we've been in, especially with SEC tournament, I feel like that was, uh, you know, definitely a, a good learning experience for us, you know just being in that kind of environment uh, leading into this weekend. So um, just being out there, staying calm. I, we've, I've been there in you know, past seasons. You know, whether I was playing or not, I, I like at least got to watch it. And then with last year, I had a little bit of experience with uh, you know, the rounds we made it in. So um, like I said, just having that past experience, I think, kind of gives me a little edge over the freshmen. But you know, then again, they're helping. We're all helping each other out. So yeah. Anything else for the players? Thanks, fellas. Thanks, John. See you tomorrow. Thank you. We'll continue with uh, for Coach. Right here. Coach, uh, you all have been able to win games without Monk taking it over in the second half, like midway of the season. 
What's been the reason for that? And do you think that's one of the reasons you have a chance to go far in this tournament? Well, Jerry, what's, there's a couple things that have happened. Early in the year, we didn't know who we were. We were just flying up and down the court. Other teams didn't know who we were. And as the season went on, you had teams that said one thing, you're not letting them run. So we had to learn to play in the half court. Uh, we had to learn to grind it out. Um, bad shots lead to, lead to bad defense. Like, well, you're not guarding. Well, you take a bad shot, it's a breakout layup. The second thing that happened is we got down 18, 19, 17 different games and came back and won and learned we could do it. But we also got up 20, 22, 23, and look around, it's a three-point game. So there were so many things that we had to learn. The other side of it is we, l we learned to win with Malik going one for 10, two for 10. He learned to play going two for 10. You're not going to go two for 20. Go two for 10 and rebound the ball, defend, do other things to help us win. Uh, we learned to play without uh, De'Aaron Fox. I believe we beat Florida without De'Aaron Fox. We learned to win without Isaiah Briscoe because Dominic played so well. Uh, you know, we learned to play either with Wenyon, go small, go big. So this has been one of those experiences. It's always a process with us because they're new teams. We have the youngest team in this tournament. And so it takes time to really figure things out and learn. But we've learned to win a lot of different ways. Over here. I, so I'll just reiterate the question, Coach. What have you maybe seen now from John and, and what he likes to do? Have you seen I that? have watched <laughs> the tape, okay? So the games that I've seen, they're tournament games, um, the UIC game, um, um, you know, they run their stuff. They have a five-man that could shoot threes. Their guards are not afraid. Um, they'll shoot threes. They'll fly up and down the court. They run good stuff in the half court. Um, they space the court. Their pick and roll stuff is good. Uh, their man to man is more of a let's make sure you're going to take a tough shot. We're going to rebound and run. Um, they do play a 2 3 zone. I've seen a little bit of 1 3 1. Um, we're in good out of bounds plays on the baseline. I mean, John's done a heck of a job. And they've won 25 games. I mean, this is a legitimately good team. And, and again, I'm just hearing scores. I'm not, I really won't watch games, but I'm hearing scores two-point game, one-point game. If you expect in this tournament to try to bury somebody, it's hard. It's hard. You're just trying to say, let's play as well as we can play. Teams this year, many teams had house money against us. They're not supposed to win. They're not expected to win. We were expected to win. They're throwing balls, shooting bank shots, hook shots, runners, balls going in. Who is that guy? He just made three threes. Those are his first three threes of the season. That's his first. I mean, that kind of stuff. So you got to come in this. Let's worry about us. Let's play with energy. Knowing this team is good enough, Northern, to beat us. Um, let's be at our best and see what happens. Right over here, Andy. John, you've been the overwhelming favorite when you guys were undefeated coming in here to like this year where you're one of a collection of teams that certainly could win it. What's more challenging? Well, I'd like to be undefeated coming into this again. That would have been better. But, you know, it's every year you come in, it's different. I mean, I remember when we won our conference tournament by 25, and our reward was to have to play Ohio State as the 1-1 seed. And if you're lucky enough to beat them, beat North Carolina with seven pros, good luck to you. Have fun. And we, Brandon Knight, made a shot at the buzzer to beat Ohio State, and we ended up in the final four. I can remember when we were seeded eight, eight, eight. And we ended up having to play Wichita State, who was undefeated. And then all of a sudden, Aaron Harrison's bombing balls at the buzzer, and we marched to the final game of the season. So we've seen, I've, you know, I've been doing this 30 years now. You know, you may not know this, I'm not the 32-year-old coach anymore. Um, so, you know, you just go in with an open mind about every game. And for us, I'm not having this. I have a different team every time we walk into this thing. So I don't know what to expect other than try to get my guys in a good frame of mind. Don't be afraid to lose. Don't be afraid to miss shots. Don't be afraid to be aggressive. Go for it. Play to win. Don't think of anything else. Forget about score. Just keep playing to win. If that's not good enough, it's been a heck of a season. All right here. 
John, has this team turned out to be deeper than you envisioned back in October, and if so, why, and, and how does that impact going forward? It's, it's turned out to be deeper because our seniors have really played well. So now Dom, Michael, and Derek, along with freshmen, uh, Wenyan and, and Isaac need to step up a little bit, um, and, and all these guys. I said, do what you do, just be a little bit better right now. Do what you do and try to do it for 40 minutes. Your whole day should be on preparing to play great for 40 minutes. If you hit your C game, you're not A. You're, a game, you're in that zone. You're making everything. You're running them. Down. Now you're in the C game. You, now you're not at your best. Make easy plays. Don't try to lose your mind. Just make the easiest play you can make. Make easy shots you can make. And then get on to the next game. So these kids, I, I think because we have seniors, who have been experienced, it makes us a different team, a deeper team. Right here. John, what is your expectation for BAM, you know, in, in this tournament? I mean, what, what are you looking for him to do, accomplish? Well, it's, it's really funny. I, you know, I've had big guys that none of them were fives. Carl's not a five. He's a double-double machine in the NBA right now. The reason is he's mad he didn't make the All-Star game, so now he's trying to take it out on everybody. But neither is Anthony Davis, neither is DeMarcus Cousins. I mean, Bam is not a five. But the way we're playing him, um, he's given us post presence, but he can shoot. He, I'll do a drill today, he's going to be shooting threes. So everybody can see. Oh, I didn't know he could do that. Well, you didn't know... Anthony could do it, and you didn't know Carl could do it because I didn't let him do it. But they're doing okay. And I think here's a guy that can guard five positions. He can make free throws. He can guard pick and roll. He can play in pick and roll, and he can space the court because he's skilled. 6'10", 6'9", 6'10", in there. A beast, head on the rim, and guard five positions. Value. I mean, that's, that's a kid that goes in and has an impact because of that. We're back in the corner over here. Ken Spencer, WHAS 11 in, in Louisville Cal. What's your take on Tom Crean being out at Indiana? Just disappointed. Hard profession. I mean, it's just disappointing. And, uh, you know, I feel for him and his family. I've been fired. I know what it's like. Um, I know what it is to your family, your wife, you know, uh, your kids. You know, they take it harder than you take it. And... Um, you know, we, two Big Ten titles in the last four years, had injuries this year, beat North Carolina, beat Kansas, have injuries, stuff happens. Um, but you know what? In this profession, you're hired and you're fired. That's the two things that happen. And you have to buy into that coming in. I, whether I think it's right or not, you know, I'm just disappointed. I'm disappointed for him and his family. But let me say this. Someone will hire him because he's Tom Crean. He can coach, he works, um, great integrity. So there'll be a job, and if he wants to take another job, he'll get it. And if not, he'll sit out and do what I did. I became the highest paid amateur golfer in the country for about six months. Right here. Right. Coach, you, you mentioned, obviously, the difficulty of the profession. On, on NKU's side, the, to go from Division two to one, where John's doing nine wins to flip that record to get here, um, do you how know, the, have, how about their facility, their arena? I mean, they have an arena that I walked in and I was like, what, wait a minute, what, what is this? And I'm looking around like they've done it right. Their campus, the community they're building, um, you know, they got Cincinnati right over the bridge, right around the corner from them. Um, and what he's done, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And that league is hard because Oakland, Valpo, you got, you know, you got tough teams in there that can play with anybody in the country. So he, uh, I know the school's excited, and they should be. And, um, you know, I knew John when he was coaching at Alabama. And I knew what they did then and how good a coach he was. So, you know, they've done great. Good players, you know. Be interesting tomorrow at midnight when we start this game. <laughs> right here, Andy. Uh, John, Mick uh, Cronin was a little uh, critical of the pod system and the way things are going in terms of selling tickets. Uh, you guys in Louisville are here. Clearly, it's going to be a great crowd, local teams. How do you feel about the way it's been structured the last couple of years? 
to protect top seeds close to home? Well, the biggest thing is they're starting to become more transparent. And you notice there was less glitches because they were just more transparent. And the more transparent, there are other things they can do to be even more transparent, the S-curve. Then move people around from the S-curve because of league, the top four seeds I'm talking about. Um, league tournaments, before they start, make an announcement what they mean for every league. This is what league tournaments mean. Make that announcement. You can't have one team move and have another team not move who beat the fifth team in the country and the third team in the country and they stay in one team. You can't. Tell us all what it means. The more transparency, this thing is even going to get better. I thought they did the best job of seeding this year that I've seen in eight years. And you're all amazed that I'm saying something nice about that committee. I, I'm just telling you, I'm wa I watch closely, and I keep saying they were more transparent this year than they've ever been. Now let's go the full money. Just keep being more transparent. Because this is for these kids. This isn't for coaches. If the kids ever said we're not playing the games, you're not getting free meals. I mean, you're not, we're not coaching. ADs aren't in hotels. I mean, it's, this is for them. And how, whatever we do, let's just make that, keep that in mind. The, the, the timing of the games, the, the way, the transparency, not for coaches and ADs, for the players to see it. So they understand why they got in and why they didn't or why they moved and why they're playing who they are. It's about those kids. And um, I'm telling you, I, thought, I think they're moving in the right direction. I think the committee is moving in the right direction. And I think if they keep being more transparent next year, they, there were one or two seeds everybody asked about. Think about it. Other years, there was uproars. This year, there wasn't. And next year, the year after, the year after, if there's more transparency, the thing will all be about the kids and the games and nothing about the selection, which is the way it should be. Right, right here. Yeah, Coach, I'm, I'm curious the response on your end about your podcast a season into it. Has it taken as much or more time than you thought it might to get guests and do this every week? I, does anybody – no, I, it, it takes me about 30 minutes a week. But does anybody know what a podcast is? Because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I never heard of a podcast. Anybody – I only did it because no other coaches are doing it. That was my question. Any other coaches doing podcasts? No, then I'm doing it. And now – you know, we had friends of mine on, and it's like two guys drinking coffee and you're a fly on the wall. And there's been over a million listens. Do you hear what I just said? People are like crazy out there. We don't know that. There were a million listens to these podcasts. Will I do it again next year? I don't know. I'm hoping 20 other coaches do them so I can stop doing it. Then I don't have to do it. But right now, I'm like the only coach that does it, so now... I'm done until the tournament's over. So there won't, I'll spend no time on it. And I didn't for this, I let him hear my news conference and my talk to my kid, and that's it. And I told him, I'm not, I'm focused on this right now, and I'm not even going to spend 30 minutes on that. And so I won't. But when it's all done, probably do a couple more episodes, and that's it, and then figure out if I want to do it next year. Right here. Cal, you said right before the season that you thought Bam could sort of be on a track like Carl and Anthony and that he'd get better and better and better as the season went on. It is, maybe it didn't look that way for a little while, but is, is he kind of exactly what you thought and how important you've said if you don't have a post presence, you're a fraud? Right, and, and let me say this. This kid, how many of you are frustrated he didn't get the ball enough? Like, you are frustrated, media. You don't even have a dog in the hunt. Like, give him the ball. He never says a word, never says one word. One time he came up to me during a game and he said, Coach, you may want to tell him to throw me the ball every once in a while. And he smiled and he and I laughed. That's the only time he said anything. He just plays. Kenny Payne at halftime. I can't believe, throw him the ball. You know, I mean, and it's not that the guys are selfish. It's that they're playing too and we're trying to figure each other out. But he's gotten better. Um, he... Again, the biggest thing is he can guard five positions. Look, when you can guard pick and roll the way he does, you have great value. When you can make free throws, it means you can shoot. Now, all of a sudden, you're skilled with the ball and you're athletic and you can fly. There, that's not normal. There's only one in five years like that. 
We've been lucky at Kentucky because we've had some big guys that are bigger. Now, they're bigger than him, but they're fours. That's what he's going to be. He's a four. He's not a five. Right here. John, something I've always been curious about, I mean, there's times this year where you've gotten after Isaiah really hard, and he's come back at you just as hard. You see it with DeMarcus Cousins. I was just curious about your, your take on coach-player interaction and, and how that's changed from you know, 30 years ago. But, uh, well, that was zero, the same way. Zero tolerance? I was, no, I was the same way. Look, many times I'm getting on a kid because I don't think he's, has, he's shown enough emotion or energy. Like, you got more, you got more than this. I'm, I got, okay, now play that way. You're just trying to get them to show they're alive. Are you alive? Like, you look like you're going. So many times I'm doing that. If there's a time that they, I don't need it to come back, I'll say stop, and they'll stop. Short of that, I'm, a, I'm Italian, I'm emotional, and I expect them not to be. And they're in this game flying up and down, and I'm sweating and losing my mind, and I get on a kid, but you can't say anything? Don't you say one. What? I've had guys come back at me. I can remember back in the UMass days. We could be more physical then. You can't be physical now. Back then I was, I was stronger and more agile than I am right now. Over here. Coach, you, you've hinted at it a little bit. Is there, is there a challenge with a, an unknown and late start, especially with how people know diets and rest and you add in all the sports science stuff, but then, I mean, it could be 9.30. It could be late. Right. Yeah, and that, and that worries me. But the, the thing that worries you more is you got the youngest team in the tournament. They've never been in this tournament setting. You're trying to talk them through, but you can't. They have to feel it. And um, we have veterans that I can go to, um, but we'll see. You don't know. I mean, that's what makes this tournament what it is. You don't know. You may think you know, but you do not know. And, you know, teams upsetting teams, that's what the whole tournament's about. You just don't want to be one of those teams that gets upset. Let it be somebody else. Anything else right, right, right here in front? Hey there, Coach. Um, and NKU, NKU is kind of in the same boat here, but what, what does it do, do for a team's confidence to make the trip just right up 65 to Indianapolis. What does it do to uh, the confidence knowing that you're playing so close to home? Well, we played here a bunch. We really, Indianapolis, you know, when you talk about sites, Indianapolis, New Orleans, you know, I mean, San Antonio, you're talking about the sites that really are so conducive to these things because everything is close. So when you come in, it's the whole environment. It's the whole, all of it. And, um, you know, we love playing in Indianapolis. I mean, I love playing games up here and tournament games or games in general. I mean, this is a, a neat city. Um, they brought some Pittsburgh here where I grew up, Primanti Brothers. If you want to try your French fries on your sandwich, they brought Pittsburgh here. So we like it. But it'll be, it'll be good for their fans, good for our fans, easy to get to. But, you know, Louisville, Dayton, think of the teams that are here that travel. Wichita travels. They travel. So it's going to be, if you have tickets, hold on to them. Don't put them in your pocket. Hold them in your hand. They're going to have value. Right here. John, I believe you said something Sunday about we're going to go see if there are any weaknesses in our defense, anything to work on. I was wondering if you discovered anything. Well, you just got to be prepared for, you know, what if this happens, what if that happens, what are we going to do? You can't say, well, if the tanks come over that hill right there, guys, if you see the top of the tank, just pray your rosary beads because we're, we're going down. You can't. If they come over that way, what are we going to do? What's our options? What else can we do? We can't just cave in. We've got to fight. We've got to do something. And that's where you are as a coach at this time. But you can't give that all to the players. You, I, I will not. I refuse to overwhelm them with tape of the other team or more than what we do will be prepared as coaches if we need to do stuff. But that's, I want them to have fresh legs, fresh minds. They're not overwhelmed with video. Let's go play basketball. Time for a couple more? Anyone? Thanks, Thanks folks.
For those of you in the media work area, we're about five minutes away from Wichita State, about five minutes. was the uh No commissioners are allowed in the press area. No commissioners are allowed in the press. Oh, hey, how you doing? I didn't even see. Didn't you see you sitting there? I haven't seen you yet. I'm sure you will be, but I haven't seen you. All right, we have uh, Wichita State with us in the interview area. And uh, we're going to take an opening statement from Coach Marshall, and then we'll go to the uh, players. When they're done with the players, we'll dismiss them and go back to Coach. So, Craig? Well, we, uh, <clears throat> we're glad to be here. Um, you know, we, we feel like we're playing well. and We know we have a tremendous challenge in front of us starting tomorrow evening with Dayton. And um, 
I've enjoyed coaching these guys tremendously all year. It's been a really fun season for us as we've watched this team blossom and mature and develop uh, right in front of our very eyes. So um, we're excited again with the opportunity. We're glad it warmed up a little bit today. It was pretty cold when we got in last night, but it's a beautiful day and we're ready to play. All right, questions for the, uh, for the players, please. Raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. Anyone, please, right here? Uh -huh. uh, for Connor and Zach, uh, you guys feel disrespected by the seed? I mean, what was your reaction? I found that you were 10. Connor? Um, we were a little bit surprised, but um, we knew we were going to have to play good teams all tournament. So um, we're excited for the task at hand, and hopefully we can come out and play well. But like I said, we, we knew we were going to have to play a good team every, every round in this tournament. Zach? Uh, like Connor said, we were surprised, but the committee, they make the season everything for a reason. So the only thing we could do is just come out and play and do what we do. Questions, please? We're going to... Question? Yeah, Jerry. Uh, for Marcus, what... what what do you think of Dayton? What challenges do you think they bring to you guys? Marcus? Um, Dayton's a great team, you know. Um, they push the ball well in transition, you know. And they're very athletic, you know. Um, they're in the A-10, a great, great conference, you know. They play a lot of great teams, a lot of tough teams. You know, we're just going to come out. We're going to have, we're gonna have to come out and play tough to, in order to win. Right over here. Uh, Zach, for you, what have you seen in the development and growth of, of Shaquille Morris? You've been with him now for a while. How far has he come as a player? Question for Zach. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty amazing to see the transition from freshman year to uh, all the way to the product you see now. Just his body, his mindset. Uh, I say his position has gotten a whole lot better a whole lot more active on defense, uh, being more aggressive to the, towards the rim instead of fading, and really, really just being a monster in there. And that's and what he's done is completely helped us out throughout this whole season. And to me, I'm very proud of him. Further questions <clears throat> for the players? We're done? OK, thanks, guys. You're dismissed. Thanks. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Question right here for Coach Marshall. Greg, what do you remember about John Brannon from the Marshall days, and did you have him pegged as a coach at that time? Uh, John Brannon, uh, very, very hard worker, number one. Um, he was the last guy to leave the gym. Tremendous uh, skills. He could shoot it and pass it. He had a quirky jump shot, and he'll laugh when I he hears me say that, but it went in. and. His fifth year after transferring into Marshall, I was the, I was the f first year assistant coach, and he was an all-conference player. He was an all-tournament player in the Southern Conference, our last year in the Southern Conference. And we came within a tip-in at the buzzer of UT Chattanooga, a team that eventually went to the Sweet 16 of going to the NCAA tournament, something Marshall has not done in a while. And, uh, Coach D'Antoni got real close this year playing in the championship game. I watched that game. I was pulling for him. But um, John Brandon was cerebral, Rhodes Scholar candidate um, as a graduate, and did not know he was going to get into coaching. I thought he would go into the corporate world and uh, be very successful there. But um, have followed his progress and his coaching career, and he obviously latched on with Anthony Grant, which was a great move at VCU and in Alabama. We've played against each other uh, several times uh, with high stakes, and just really like John and his family. Got to know them as well. They're a wonderful family. He's a obviously a fantastic young man and a great coach, and that program is now in its uh, first year eligible for the tournament, second year for him as a head coach, and here they are. Right, right here. Paul Sondrop, Wichita Eagle. Greg, uh, Archie Miller mentioned that he watched that Wichita State in the 2013 Final Four, and that provided a little bit of, you know, blueprint that a program like 
similar to yours can you know can play that way and get to those those places. How often do you hear that from from other coaches? And and I guess that would be satisfying to hear that you've kind of provided that kind of a map for some of those schools. Well, I don't I don't hear that that often, but it was nice to hear that from him in our coaches meeting today. And and this is a guy who has has been inspirational in his own right. He he was uh, an inspiration to play in the ACC at North Carolina State as, you know, he's not the biggest guy in the world, but his, his heart and his uh, talent uh, are supersede his, his size, and, and now he's doing it on the coaching level. So he's obviously been an inspiration to others as well. Uh, it's nice to hear him say that. Uh, that was a magical run, and, you know, it was something that, you know, we followed up with the undefeated season and then a sweet 16 and then a couple of more wins in the tournament. So... It was the it was the impetus of what we're doing today. Andy, uh, Greg Cal was just here and said that uh, the selection committee did the best job seeding he's seen in the last eight years. What do you think? Uh, you know, I'll defer to Cal on that. They, they 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 they're probably more likely to talk to him about seeding and where he wants seeds to be than than they'll they they would be to me. They, they don't call me. They don't ask me anything and. Uh, they probably don't care that I, I, I disagree with the seedings. It's a great tournament. Uh, I'm kind of used to the the, the uh, short end of the stick, if you will, on the seedings. But uh, that being said, we, we usually wear the dark uniforms, and we've won nine games in the last four years. So uh, as Connor mentioned, we're going to play great teams in this tournament, regardless of where they seed you. Uh, I've enjoyed watching the games uh, today, and there's been some – great games with lower seeds either coming close to winning or winning and you know we know we've got a challenge tomorrow this could the, the seeds could easily be flip-flop but still you're playing a, a great team and a well-coached team and a, a team with veterans and seniors so they've they've had their success in the NCAA tournament as well this should be a, a tremendous game and then whoever wins gets the winner of Kentucky Northern Kentucky right here, here we had two right here you're right yeah Jerry Tipton, Lexington Herald Leader. How big of a wave of momentum are you guys riding into the tournament? Uh, Jerry, I think we're we're playing very well. Uh, I don't know how the, I guess, 11 days, maybe 12 days since we played on Sunday and our Valley Championship on CBS two Sundays ago. What's that going to be? 12 days now. Um, we've tried to keep them fresh mentally. We've tried to give their bodies some rest physically. Um, but in the end, uh, we haven't played anyone else for 12 days. So the layoff will, it'll be interesting to see how that affects us. Um, I'm not sure, well, Dayton, Dayton's had some time off too. They probably had uh, a week off. But the bottom line is, uh, you've got, again, two good teams. And we feel like we were really starting to peak in, in late February, early March. Hopefully we can carry that over into mid-March. Right here. Greg, you've obviously talked a lot about, you know, some of the scheduling challenges. Archie Miller's had similar problems. Power Five schools aren't lining up to play you guys. What, what's the solution? I mean, what should be done to make sure that, you know, we have more of those matchups in the non-conference season? It's a great question, Myron. I, I, think, um, I think you would almost have to mandate that these Power Five teams have to play X amount of games on the road. Um, you know, they've got the money with the, the TV and the, the bowl games and all of that to uh, do basically what they want. And if they never have to leave their building or go play anyone, um, it's gotten easier for us in the past four or five years. Um, for instance, this year we, we scheduled Oklahoma and we scheduled Oklahoma State. We're in the, the Bahamas tournament. Next year we're in the Maui tournament and we're going back to the Bahamas tournament in, th in four years. So. We're playing the best that we can, but we would like a few more of those. Uh, I, 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 I sympathize. We play Tulsa home and home, St. Louis home and home. Those are regional rivals that generally are pretty good, but a couple of them had bad years this year, and that's hard to, hard to predict when these schedules are made two and three years in advance. But um, we played Colorado State on the road, another good team. We want to play the best that we can. We try to, we try to go to the best exempt tournaments possible. Uh, we, we play the, the best Power Five or BCS schools that will play us home and home. 
and we're continually looking at that. But I, something that we're, we're trying to work on extending the series with Oklahoma. Coach Kruger's been awesome. And maybe, maybe we can schedule something with Dayton. Maybe, maybe that's the way to go. Maybe we can schedule something with Butler. We played and we practiced in Hinkle Fieldhouse today. Uh, those are probably the answers. But I think the BCS Power Five teams that don't have to go on the road. And then, then they also have the opportunity for quality wins. But uh, many of them get a lot of quality losses as well. Right here. Bob Lutz, Wichita Eagle. You've been openly critical of Shaquille Morris during parts of his career at Wichita State. What do you think was the trigger that got him to play in a way that you're now fairly satisfied with? I would say I'm more than fairly satisfied. Um, you know, Shaq is one of those guys that kind of got away with some things in high school because of his immense size and strength. He was like the bully on the playground. And... Uh, it's, it's, it's not just the basketball court that we've had to push him, Bob. It's, it's uh, in academics as well. But I, I also uh, I want to clarify that uh, I've told him many times this year as he's made steps towards being the, the, the student and the player that he can be, how proud I am of him and, and, and his, his maturation process. Uh, he's, he's come a long way. And as a coach, uh, the, the, the way we try to do it, we try to develop the person, the student, and the player. He is a great shining example of a guy that's come a long way in all three of those categories. Right here. Every year your name comes up when there's coaching vacancies, and obviously that's kind of happening again this year. But I'm wondering, with those uh, frustrations or challenges with scheduling and seating, could that ever be a tipping point for you to go elsewhere? Or are those things you consider when you're getting offers? You know, um, n not really. Uh, I, first of all, um, I don't know what you're, what you're talking about. I have no one's talked to me or no one's talked to anybody that represents me. There's no, been no discussion of any of these jobs. In fact, I don't even know what jobs are open, to be honest. There's a lot of uh, action that takes place every day and every week, it seems. But um, we, we value... Um, the, the life that we lead and, and whether we're uh, taken care of. We've got a great administration at Wichita State. Uh, they've been very, very um, supportive and generous and kind to my family. And, you know, I've got um, not just me, but I've got my family and I've got my players. And, you know, we, we're, we think we've got something really good going. So, I don't really worry about it. I think it's a, a very humbling to, to have your name mentioned with these jobs. And sometimes I listen and, you know, ultimately maybe I'll take one. But right now we're very, very happy where we are. Uh, the city of Wichita is, is a, a wonderful place to live and it's treated my family and, and a lot of people very, very well. And uh, we, we, we're, we're very content, but at the same time, uh, we don't bury our head in the sand. I've said that before, and we listen, and, and maybe, maybe there'll be a time for us to make a move, but I don't know when that's going to be. Right here. Going back to the scheduling uh, topic, at this point, I mean, the way that the, the committee has treated you guys a couple years in a row, does it become something where you feel like maybe the Missouri Valley is being disrespected or you guys need to pursue other conference options? How, how do you think that that can be remedied with your, on the league side of things? You know, I, I, I don't, that's beyond my decision-making level. Uh, that's a presidential deal as far as conference affiliation. I just think there's a, there's a little bit of a movement, it seems, uh, by the committee to squeeze out the non-Power Five. I really feel that. I mean, and then uh, if, if they're going to allow a lot of these Power Five teams in, um, then they're going to place them against one another in the tournament. I mean, we're, go we're playing Dayton. Gonzaga played. Who did they play? Um, who did Gonzaga play? VCU plays um, somebody. Winthrop played Butler. I mean, it's, it's amazing. South Dakota State. South Dakota State. They want to. They want to weed out the, the non-Power Fives as quickly as possible, it appears. And uh, when I left the room, it was uh, Middle Tennessee was up nine against uh, Minnesota. And, you know, 
there's, there's, a, there's a lot of quality basketball being played at some of these places. And, and I'll go a step further. There's a lot of bad basketball being played at the Power Five leagues. Right here. Greg, can I get your reaction to Dave Stallworth's passing? Yeah, I was going to say something at the end if no one asked me about that, Bob. Uh, perhaps, and I didn't get a chance to see him play for the Shockers, but I did get a chance to see him play for the Knicks. Uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Shockers of all time passed away last night. Dave the Rave Stallworth. Um, you know, our, our sympathies go out to his family. Uh, he was a tremendous gentleman and a, and a true fan of the Shockers. In my first six or seven years uh, as the head coach, he, was, he would be at games, just about every game, and as his, as his f health started to fail, he was there less and less. And we knew about his um, illness. We sent a card to him early in the week. And, you know, we'll be playing this tournament with a heavy heart because he was a true gentleman and a wonderful representative representative of, of Wichita and Wichita State University. Right here, Jerry. Uh, Greg, you, you suggested about uh, weeding out the Power Five, and I'm, I'm wondering what is the incentive the to- The non-Power Five. I'm sorry, the, yeah, big distinction. Uh, the non-Power Five, how much of that do you think is uh, wanting marquee teams, the more money-making possibilities uh, for TV and the TV contracts? That could be the case, uh, Jerry. I, I really don't know the, the answer to that question because I don't study the Nielsen ratings and all that. But to me, this tournament, when, you know, and obviously there are a lot of people that only know the top 10 or 15, 20 teams in the country. They only know the Kentuckys and the Dukes and the UCLAs. That's all they know. They don't know the Wichita States, the Middle Tennessees, the Daytons. Or, and they, they kind of dismiss us, if you will. But... When the tournament comes around, that's what makes the tournament so special. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to take anything away from uh, the wonderful game that Villanova and North Carolina played last year. I know I was on the edge of my seat. I really enjoyed watching it as a spectator. But, you know, I just don't think that weeding out the non-Power Fives is, is going to help the interest in those brackets and people that fill out the brackets and people that have interest in the underdog or the the team that's supposed to uh, not win that wins and makes it to the second weekend or the third weekend like butler and vcu and we've done recently anything else for coach sure no worries just one thing about you, you mentioned about your team peaking or starting to peak late February and into March. What was, what did you see that told you, I mean, what's your approach to basketball as a team and what, what was working so well? Jerry, we've been able to score the basketball very well this year. We've got, we can strike you from all five spots on the floor. That has not been our problem. We've scored over 80 points 20 something times this year. Uh, we, we continue to get better defensively. Our numbers, our, our analytic numbers and whatnot continue to improve defensively as the, as the season went on. They weren't quite as good as last year, but last year was hard to improve upon. We were the single best defensive team in the country. So as we started to get better defensively, Shaq Morris got healthy from an, a midseason thigh injury, and I finally was smart enough to hand the ball to a freshman point guard, Landry Shamit. That took Connor Frankamp off the ball, and he could just concentrate on scoring. And those three things, I think, um, along with a couple of guys like Zach Brown and Richard Kelly accepting their roles on our team and becoming great defenders and energy givers. And um, it's, really, it's really been a, a, a really nice uh, experience for me as a coach to watch our team. It's almost been like time-lapse photography, watching a flower bloom. That's what it's been like to watch our team develop into a cohesive juggernaut, if you will. That it? Thanks, Coach. See you Thank tomorrow. you. All right.
the time of the schedule? I know we got 10 minutes. Um, so I just have this this afternoon. They can't do anything live. ESPN cannot do anything live in the building tomorrow. They could do something from there today, but not in the building, right? Correct? But not in the bowl. I think. So, because he was also asking about back of the house.
For those of you in the media work area, we are about five minutes away from northern Kentucky. Kentucky is on its way to the interview room. Teams are you covering? <laughs> I thought he, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's, he was good. All right, we're joined by Northern Kentucky, and uh, we'll continue the same format. We'll have an opening statement from Coach Brandon, then we'll go to the players, and then after we're done with the players, we'll dismiss them, and we'll continue with the coach. So, John? Uh, obviously an honor to be here, really excited about the opportunity to be here in Indianapolis uh, for, our, for our school's first you know, representation in the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, for our guys, it's really been a, you know, an outstanding year. Um, you, know, you hear the word Cinderella, it's something that takes place once you get to the dance. But for us, it hasn't been like that throughout the regular season. You know, 24 and 10, I think winning 12 of our last 14 and uh, nine of our last 10, I believe. So, um, you know, we talked about all year playing our best basketball when it got to March. I felt like we've done that for the most part. Um, and certainly, I know you guys will open up the questions as to who we're playing, but you know, excited to get the opportunity to play against a prestigious program like Kentucky. Okay, let's uh, go to questions for the players. If you would raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Jerry, right here. Uh, Jerry Tipton, Lexington Herald Leader. Cole, I'm under the impression that w when you committed to uh, Northern Kentucky, you knew that it would be a one-shot deal with the NCAA uh, playing in it. 
What led you to do that? Question for Cole. Yeah, um, first of all, uh, I, I, just, I committed because of uh, the location it was in. I really loved everything about the university. Um, academically, it had everything I was looking for. Um, the facilities at the mid-major level was a lot higher than the other schools that I had visited previously. And then uh, for me and the other seniors that are on the roster, it was all about building a program. And, uh, and, and what we wanted to do was, was bring something back to Northern Kentucky that, uh, that we hadn't seen before. And um, for us, I feel like we, we've done that to this point, and uh, we're really excited about the opportunity that we have ahead of us. Right over here. Mark Story, Lexington Herald Leader. LeVon, uh, Dominique Hawkins and Derek Willis both talked about playing against you, you know, and playing in AAU and in high school. What are your recollections of, go of playing against them or with them in AAU? Question for LeVon. Um, pl uh, I, I play with Dominique Hawkins in AAU. Um, he's a good player, fun to play with, and um, Derek Willis is also a good competition to play against. More questions, please? Right here, Jay. Drew, I wonder if uh, playing Kentucky, is this something that's like a, uh, something you'll be telling your, your grandkids about sometime in the, in the, you know, in the future? Drew. Um, I think just this whole experience in general will be something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. Um, just growing up, watching the NCAA tournament, it just was a cool experience. And then coming here and getting a chance to play in it. And then a big school like Kentucky is just a great opportunity for us. Right here. I'm Jim Lazarski with the Cincinnati Inquirer. For you guys, when did, it, when did this week become about business? Obviously, you knew you're, you earned a berth and you were waiting for selection Sunday. Did it, you know, Sunday night? When did you guys kind of get into Kentucky wanting to watch them or, or study them? Or, you know, when did that turn and, and what has this week been like in that regard? Drew, we'll Any of you players. Yeah, we'll start with Drew. Um, really, after the selection show, we had a meeting uh, with Coach and our uh, managers and players and everybody, and really that's when it really started. I mean, we enjoyed the experience of Selection Sunday, but uh, once we heard Kentucky and we had a meeting right after that, that's really when our business got started. We got in practice the next day, got in the game plan a little bit, and got more in depth as the week went on. LeVon? Um, really, it's been about business the whole year for us. Uh, it really began for the NCAA tournament, I think, two days right after we won the conference tournament. We was right back in the gym. So, Cole? Yeah, what they, what they both just said. I mean, um, right after the selection show, like he said, we met. And uh, from then on, we uh, put a game plan in. And uh, this whole week, we went, we went after it and uh, got prepared. Right here. Cole, how much of an awe factor might there be? You know, it's your first time in the tournament, and they're the winningest program in college basketball. Cole? Uh, I mean, you can't look at it that way. Um, you got to come in w as, it's a, as if it's a faceless opponent. Like, we use the term all year. Um, no matter who we play, we prepare as if we're playing anybody. And um, this week's no different. Um, it doesn't matter what stage we play on, who we play, where we play. Uh, we, we go in basically saying, like, it's anybody else. Right here. This is for all the players. On a normal week, if I'm a student on the NKU campus, how many people in UK shirts do I see? And are there more NKU shirts now? Drew, we'll start with you. You'll see a couple throughout campus. I mean, really at the beginning of the year, you'd see some. And as the basketball season got on, we got more students to the game. They kind of dwindled down. But uh, I did read something where any student who got a free ticket to the game or won a ticket is not allowed to wear UK stuff. So that's kind of it's kind of nice knowing that we're going to have NKU, black and gold, coming to support us. But they've dwindled down as we've started winning games, and they've come in to support us more. LeVon? Well, um, I only take one class on campus right now, so I don't get on campus much. But when I do, I, I don't see many, NK, um, many UK shirts. How about you, Cole? I would say three years ago, I used to see a lot. And then uh, this, this year, it's, it's really toned down a lot, so it's been nice to see. Right here. LeVon, can you tell us about a kid from Ballard playing at Northern and now playing against UK? LeVon? Oh, could you ask that one more time? You're from Ballard High School, right? Yeah. And you're now playing against UK. Tell, tell us, a kid from uh, Louisville and going to Northern, now playing against UK. What's that like? Uh, I think it's a good opportunity um, that I've been blessed with. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it was something that I um, like dreamed about, but it is something that I've always wanted to do. Jerry? Oh, 
there have been uh, some 15s to beat twos in the last few years. I'm wondering how much you guys maybe take some, uh, uh, what, confidence uh, that you can be another one. Cole? I mean, that's something that you look at, and um, you know what craziness happens in the tournament, and obviously anything can happen. Um, but like I said before, we just try to pre prepare for whoever we play. Um, you know, we don't look at the seeding. Uh, we don't look at the tradition of the other school or anything like that. We just come in every day um, and, and do it like we've been doing, and it's helped us be successful this far. Anything else for the uh, right here? Okay. Just to kind of piggyback off that, though, how, how hard is it, though, as, as – when you look at rosters or their roster, kids either played AAU with, I mean, you know your class rankings when you come out as, as high school kids. You know some of these guys are going to be in the NBA next year. Has, how, has that been hard at all to, to not even to think about measuring up or, or how we'll do against that type of guy, I guess? And I think any of you can answer that. Um, start with, yeah, start, go ahead, Drew. I think it's kind of motivation, really. Um, it's a great opportunity for us that uh, they're on national TV all the time and they get all this exposure and we're more of a lower mid-level mid-major team and we don't get the exposure that to do so being on a national stage like this gives us a chance to expose our talents and expose how we play as a team but um, it's really it's some motivation just seeing like the rankings coming out and and seeing guys that you're gonna play in the NBA with and you play I played against several of them and against AAU so I know what they are. We played against them. We beat a couple of their teams in AAU. So it's really just going to play like another game. Like Cole said, it's a faceless opponent. You want anybody else to answer that? You good? OK. Anything else right here? Cole, you went to high school about 80 miles from here. You played, you know, some of your teammates kind of went to high school in Indianapolis. Have you guys talked about how unique this experience is to have, you know, the first tournament game that you guys are playing to play it right here in Indianapolis? Cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty special, you know, to have the first tournament um, for the, for this school be in a place where you know I basically grew up, um, you know, us, PG, uh, Jordan, and I, we uh, we talk about how cool it is that we get to experience this back in uh, our home state. Anything else, Jerry? Yeah, right here. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I'm wondering for any of you guys if you if you had time to stop and smell the roses, the accomplishment of being the first, you know, to, in your first year of eligibility doing it, or was it at all, you know, was there no time for that? You know, it's business, business. Cole, we'll start with you. You know, um, a day or two after we won the conference tournament, that's when it really sank in, and, and you understand what we've accomplished, and um, not only for us as a team, but as the university as a whole, and to see all the people that it affects, all the alumni that come out and reach out to you and say how special it is and uh, they thank us for what we've done. But um, other than that, it's uh, ever since we found out who we play, it's been business like from there. LeVon? Well, for me, it's just we're going to take this as far as we can and then when it's all over and then we'll just soak in what we've accomplished. Drew? Kind of like what they both said. I mean, we got a little bit of a layoff after we won the conference championship. So a day or two, we got to kind of let it sink in a little bit and enjoy it. But uh, we got right back to work even before Selection Sunday. We were back in practice working on our game, working on us. And we're going to take this thing. We're going to keep fighting and see how far we can take this thing. And uh, once it's all done, we'll have a chance to step back and realize how great of a year we had. I mean, we got 24 wins right now. And uh, hopefully we can increase that. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Continue for uh, questions for Coach Brandon. Right here. John, you were able to sign two first-team Kentucky All-Staters last year, including Mr. Basketball. You've signed a really good player in the current class. Did you take the job planning to emphasize in-state recruiting, and are even you a little surprised at you know, how well you've been able to do this quickly? Yeah, Mark. I, you know, we, we, our basis on taking over the program was really twofold, was to build the culture immediately and try to do that with the current players we had in which we took over the job last year with the team that was in transition, transitioning to Division One, transitioning into a new league in the horizon. And then the second piece was the recruiting piece. We did gain traction in recruiting probably quicker than we gained traction in anything in our program. And I had to do with I have great staff. Um, State of Kentucky was really good at the time. We took over the job. We had some connections involved with Carson Williams, Mason Faulkner. You know, LeVon Holland's the guy we signed. Uh, Drew and Cole were already here. So uh, it was a situation for us where 
once we gained that traction pretty quickly, it kind of snowballed from there. And good players want to play with good players. And we had an outstanding first recruiting class. And I think any coach will tell you, when you take over a program, those first two recruiting classes are awfully important in today's day and age of winning so fast. And uh, marry that with the culture that was built in the first year, um, the, the, you have a 24-win team this year. Right here. Steve Jones from the uh, Curry Journal. Uh, John, specifically about one of those in-state guys, LeVon, um, how important is it to, to have a guy uh, played at Ballard and was a, was a quality high player, uh, you know, from Louisville? And, and then, you know, just specifically about his game, what do you like? And, and how has he stepped up for you guys the last few weeks? Well, he's been phenomenal. Uh, you know, at the, especially at that point guard spot, he's, he's dynamic in what he can do with the basketball. And he's a big part of the run that we've had and the way we've had a successful season. Yeah, the fact that he comes from a storied program like Ballard, you know he appreciates and winning, understands winning, has been coached. Um, but more importantly, and I think you guys you probably saw that with, the, with the, the way they speak and how they handle themselves, he's a great kid. And for me, this has probably been one of the most enjoyable teams I've coached in my 18 years in the profession. Um, and it's nice that, you know, he's specific to LeVon, you know, being a Kentucky kid. Mike Drew. Jerry. John, I wonder if you would buy the David and Goliath storyline here. And if so, what, what is the rock in your slingshot? Right. Well, I know you guys would like us to, um, but it's, it's not who we are. We're, we're, we're going to go every day. We're, we're a process-oriented group. Uh, we divorce ourselves from outcomes. We focus on possession by possession, day by day. What you heard out of our young men today is what they believe in. And, you know, this is a 15-2 seed. The committee put this, Northern Kentucky versus Kentucky. It's a good storyline, first time ever versus the greatest program in college basketball history. Um, it's an opportunity for us to continue to play well, hopefully, and we'll take it as that. But when you're in the eye of the storm, Jerry, I don't, you know, I don't know that many coaches look at it like that. Right over here. Chris LeVar, Tom Leach Productions. John, could you speak to your familiarity with the history of the program and what's your relationship like with Ken Shields? Uh, I'm from Northern Kentucky, so I've got a tremendous, a lot of the, the two national championship finalist teams in Division II were guys that I grew up with. Coach Shields calls me after every game, giving me a congratulatory message. Um, I feel extremely connected with the university. Uh, 20 plus years ago, the Northern Kentucky University was a, uh, a school that was not a destination school. It was a school where kids went to school so they could afford to go to Louisville and Kentucky. It's now a destination school. You know, we're up over 15,000 students. We're three generations of graduates. I think you can tell I can go on and on and on. I've got tremendous love for this university and a tremendous amount of respect for what the program has done in the past to get us to the Division I level. Right here. I'm Brian Rickard from Frankfurt State Journal. Talk about the freshman season Carson has had. You know what, he is, I made mention this all year long. He is the, he started being the most consistent freshman I've ever coached. He's now probably one of the most consistent players I've ever coached. And I've been at every level. And what I mean by that is every day he's the same. He's a hard working, you know, toughness is a big, it's a core value of our program. And he's really increased the toughness of our program. Uh, he, he's really moved the needle uh, in a lot of different ways. And a joy to coach, doesn't say a whole lot. Uh, he probably wouldn't get two words out of him on this podium. But he's a guy who every day impacts his team. Right here. John, when you guys are playing well, what is working? Yeah. What, what, what is the, the, the approach you guys have? Yeah, we're, we're, Jerry, we're really up and down. We try to play, you know, we, we shot the most threes and made the most threes in the league in the Ryzen. You know, we play very free offensively. Um, you know, we'll get up in full court a little bit defensively, but we want the game to be motion, but we want the game to be free flowing with the ball to move. And, you know, I think, the, you know, rebounding-wise, we've been a top 50 rebound team most of the year. So from a, a visual standpoint, I like to think we're a fun team to watch. Um, most of the people that come to that have seen that. So we'll see more. Right here. Coach, what, um, what or who, I guess, really caught your eye or, or maybe has kept you awake this week, you know, in terms of watching UK and, and what, you know, you're, you're going to try to have your guys do? Right. Well. Yeah, they got three top 15 draft picks. They got a Hall of Fame coach. I mean, I could go on and on about what keeps you awake at night. Um, they've, they've got everything that, that you need to be successful. What I've been most impressed with is this Kentucky team. And again, you know, I, I've coached against, I was at Alabama for six years. So, you know, Coach Cal does a great job of putting guys in spots and doing a great job of mixing talents together. Um, 
I think what, what probably our guys, the adjustment that will be made would be the speed because their speed doesn't show up on tape as well as it shows up in person. Right? Fair, yeah. John, you were running through some metrics about how NKU has evolved in recent years. How big a platform is just this, you know, playing UK in the NCAA tournament to sort of spread that story throughout the, the, the Commonwealth? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to the NCAA it's first and foremost. I mean, only two teams since 1970 have done it in their first year. Um, that, that's a tremendous accomplishment that our guys will get a chance to take stock in when the season's over. Um, because it's just not normal. Now, again, it wasn't a Cinderella story. This is a team that was 12 and 6 in the regular season, tied for third in the league. So, you know, this is a quality basketball team. Now, you put it on top of the fact that you get to play Kentucky, you know, that, that obviously adds to it, but you're going to play somebody really good regardless when you're a 14 or 15 seed. Anything else for Coach? But uh, there have been uh, 15s that beat twos in recent years. What, how, how does that play on your mind? It doesn't play on mine because I think there, each game's its own situation and each game's got its own life. You know, maybe it plays to the, speaks to the confidence of maybe other teams or maybe some of my players. But specifically to us, we've got a task at hand that we've got to be able to accomplish. And, uh, you know, we've got, to, we've got to prepare to do that. We've prepared all week. and It'll be a possession by possession thing. But it really doesn't speak much to, to anything that really inf influences us this week. Was that the answer you thought? <laughs> Anything else for John? All right, see you tomorrow, Coach. Thanks, guys. I'm with, yeah, I'll, I'll take them. Thanks, Will. Thanks for all your help.